Well, no matter what side of the aisle one finds themselves on politically, I think we can all agree there have been some really bad politicians. Now, I know we like to think of it as a new thing, and we have no shortage, mind you. You have some coming to mind right now. Don't say them out loud. But we have had a man run for president who wears a boot on his head and promises a pony for every citizen if he wins. There was a stretch after the Civil War, and again, remember, this country did have a civil war. So just in case you think we were at the low point of our nation's history, we had a civil war. So just to try and give us a little bit of perspective, shortly after the Civil War, well, really a whole generation after the Civil War, politics was heated. Almost daily, there were marches and torches, and there was, there was protestations, and there was anger and violence and rioting. I mean, we have had in our nation's history a sitting vice president kill the nation's treasury of secretary in a duel. That's our country. We had a president after a failed assassination beat the suspect with the cane until the cops arrived, which I actually think that's a pretty noble character trait to have in a president. But we think tweets and social media posts have gotten out of hand. I just want to remind you that politicians have always been a sketchy breed. We've had politicians promise to cure diseases, promises to eliminate taxes, and promises to give everyone a pony. But you know who else isn't a good politician? Jesus. That's right. Think about it. Was he a wonderful leader? Absolutely. But a politician? I think one could argue he was one of the worst. Did he work a crowd and able to bring everyone together? Was he a bipartisan beast? No, I think, in fact, you could say he failed at being a politician. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 10. Our text this morning as we're making our way through the Gospel of John, I think it's going to expose that you could call Jesus the worst politician of all time or, or the world's worst politician. He cannot seem to say the words necessary to bring everybody together. He can't even get the majority on his side. He would not win any elections in his day. He doesn't unify the people. In fact, he openly and aggressively divides them. How can that be? How is it possible that a man who can provide free food, not just pledge, you know, food stamps, how can it be that a man who can heal people, not just promise free health care? How can it be a man who can give life, not just promise lower taxes? How can such a man fail at politics? How can anyone who has that ability not be popular? We're going to pick up in our text this morning in John chapter 10, verse 22. If you are new to the scriptures, the gospel of John, get in the middle, move to the right, you're going to run into some, you'll see some unfamiliar names, and then you'll find some names that seem familiar, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. The chapter numbers are the big numbers, the little numbers are the verse numbers. It's just a, a helpful way for us to navigate this large text. We're moving through the gospel of John, and in John chapter 10, we're going to pick up, and I'm going to read for us our text this morning, beginning in verse 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon, and so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, is greater than me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. From which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? 
And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. You see, Jesus was not about politics. He was not about bringing everyone together regardless. The reality is Jesus was not about government. He was about truth. Now, there will be a day when he comes about government. There will be a day where he comes as king and ruler, but not this trip. The reality is Jesus divides. Jesus divides. And you see it in this text. You see both responses to Jesus. You see his detractors and his supporters ultimately divided over who Jesus is himself. If you pick up the text, we find our context in verse 22, at the time of the Feast of Dedication. Now remember, the Gospel of John is less chronological than the synoptics. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are Gospels. They're called the synoptics because they have a similar view of the life of Christ. The Gospel of John is written more theologically. It's constructed more theologically. So we'll take certain events and put them side by side, and we'll see even in our text why he did this, why he knit it together in this way. But in the white space, we're we're time traveling a little bit between our last text and this one. And so it says, at the time of the Feast of Dedication. What feast is that? I don't remember that being a prescribed feast in the Old Testament. Well, good for you, because it wasn't. In fact, this comes about because in the second century B.C., Israel was attacked. They were attacked by Antiochus Epiphanes IV. How do you like that name? His nickname was The Wicked. Now that, that's a gnarly nickname. The Wicked. That's it. That's what his nickname was. And it was duly appointed to him. He slaughtered men. He sold women and children into slavery. He set out to banish the entire religion of the Jewish people. Feasts, Sabbaths, circumcisions, all prohibited under his reign. Sacred books were destroyed or had to be surrendered. It was punishable by death if you did anything to follow after the Jewish God. Ultimately, he desecrated the temple by setting up an idol in the altar of the temple and calling all the Jews to bow down to it. But he drastically underestimated the national zeal of these people, a passion that filled the Jews And so there was a small group of Jews known as the Maccabees in a town northwest of Jerusalem that decided to not cave into the request. And they went so far even to demonstrate this as one of the pacifist Jews that was just going along with it started to make a sacrifice to this idol and in their protection of truth, they killed the Jew right there on the altar. He stepped up for the pagan sacrifice and they slayed him which is old school faithful men. It makes you think back to Samuel when Samuel came up after the king of Agag was told to be destroyed and the Jewish people did not, the king did not destroy. And so Samuel, the prophet and priest, came and hacked Agag to pieces. This is what these men endeavored to do. Following this, the Jews ultimately defeated Antiochus and the Syrians and they regained control of Jerusalem in 165 B.C. The people celebrated Oh, they celebrated. In fact, this was uh, a, a coronation, a celebration that really resembled sort of our Independence Day. It was for them a modern independence. It was a great deliverance, and so they had a festival set up for it. This dedication, this eight nights of celebration, or as you may have come to hear it, Hanukkah. They celebrate it even today. And it's against this backdrop that the people who are celebrating their own independence from the oppressors that be against this backdrop, we find Christ and his disciples walking under the portico of Solomon in the temple. This is the east side of the temple that would be overlooking the Mount of Olives and the Kidron Valley. 
Later in Acts chapter 3 and 5, we find out that, that the apostles were proclaiming Christ and people come to Christ. So this is a preview of coming attractions. It's exciting. But then the text gives us the drama. So that's the setting. And then the text picks up the drama in verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And the, the grammar here gives indication that this was just nagging. This was them coming around. This would be like, have you seen it when journalists are getting ready? There's a press conference <clears throat> and the journalists become obnoxious and they all just start firing questions out like a barrage. We're just going to wear down the person until they finally answer. This is the setting you have. These are Jews just continuing to lob these questions at Christ. When are you going to tell us? How long will you keep us in suspense? And really this idea is you are aggravating us. Tell us what you really feel. Tell us what you really believe. Are you the Christ? And while it's true that there's no record that Jesus explicitly claims to be the Messiah in front of a Jewish context, uh, we have him with the Samaritan woman at the well, and we have him in Matthew 16 talking to the disciples, but he tells both of them, both of those situations, don't go tell anyone. And yet, if you've walked through the Gospel of John with us, you know that he's done everything, if not explicitly, calling himself the Messiah. The pages are filled with his implications, his implicit acknowledgement. Tell us who you are. And this isn't because they're curious. This is they want it on record. This is tell us who you are. And they kind of slide the microphone up. And like, Make sure you say it loud enough into the recording. This is evidence. This is what they want to be able to take to the courts. Are you the Christ? Now, for those of you who are new to the Scriptures, this is a politically loaded and biblically loaded title. This is the Messiah. This is the appointed one or anointed one. This is the promised one. And to the Jews in this day, they had in their mindset, this would be the king, this would be a ruler, this would be a political savior that would free them from Rome, akin to the Maccabean revolt. As they look back during this celebration, they say, are you going to free us here? Are we going to have another Independence Day? Are you that kind of guy? You see, they wanted some of the Messiah. They wanted the lion of the tribe of Judah, but they did not want the Passover lamb. It's interesting, some of us, we even talking this week. It's interesting that even today in Jewish synagogues, they will not read the section of Isaiah that Dan read last week about the suffering servant because it doesn't fit their paradigm. It doesn't fit what they want as the Messiah. And Jesus was very careful in his response. He doesn't incite the people in their ignorance. He doesn't even directly use the term. Notice how he responds. Look at the text. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe. I told you. In fact, Jesus is sitting here, and this is what's ironic, is John has just put this up against the text where Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, all but telling them, I am the Messiah. I am the one. I am the shepherd that's described in Psalm 23. How many times has he implied or impressed this truth on them? Verse 25, he said, not only did I tell you in my speech, but in my works. I want you to think back just through the Gospel of John. How many times has his testimony pointed to him being the Messiah? He turned water into wine. He healed the nobleman's son. He healed a lame man. He fed the multitude. He walked on water. He calmed the storm. He healed a man born blind. All of these checking boxes off to verify that he is indeed the one that was promised the one to whom the Jews would look and yearn for all their days, and yet they don't believe. John says he writes this gospel so that they would believe. And if readers who are to read this and draw these conclusions, how much more so should be the ones that sat under him? How much more should those who saw him actually do these deeds? And yet Jesus says, verse 26, but... You do not believe. Why? Isn't there something in you that thinks, if Jesus walked through my neighborhood and he started healing people in my neighborhood and he turned water into wine at my cookout, I think my neighbors would believe. 
Isn't there something in us that thinks, if he was just here, if he would just do what he did, people would believe? But the Scriptures point to the fact that that's not the case. They don't believe. These were not people who were ignorant of what Jesus had done or ignorant of what Jesus had said. They were not distanced from him. They had followed him. They knew. They had notebooks about what he had done. So why did they not believe? Verse 26, because you are not among my sheep. This is hard to process, isn't it? But it's consistent. In John chapter 8, he who is of God hears the word of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Or 1 John 4, 6, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. The reality, friends, is this. The natural man, the sinful man, will always, without fail, choose to ignore God, to suppress the truth in his heart, to deny the reality in his soul until, unless, the Lord softens his heart and opens his eyes. Have you ever asked the question, why did Lazarus' roommates in the tomb not get up with him? Jesus is speaking outside. Why did they not hear and follow because they could not hear. In fact, Lazarus could not hear unless the Lord opened his ears and gave him breath and life to hear. The same is true. Apart from the Lord working in us, we will stay in our oppression of the truth. We will stay in our resistance and our rebellion. No matter how much education and learning, no, much how, no matter how much truth is put before us. In fact, friends, if you were raised in the church, this is a danger for you to think that just because Jesus has been put before you, that you are safe. To just think because you have a knowledge of who Jesus is, that you are okay. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to pray that the Lord would open your eyes to embrace him for who he is. We will see In contrast, what happens to the ones that do? Look at verse 27. My sheep, you could almost say my sheep, however, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. This is two vital characteristics of the children of God. They hear and they obey. This is true of every disciple. Now, again, we know that we don't hear perfectly and we don't obey perfectly, but a characteristic of a true disciple is one that hears God and obeys. They're not persuaded by the stranger because they don't recognize his voice. They hear the voice of the shepherd, and not only do they hear, they obey. Please understand, it is not noble or righteous merely to hear, merely to place yourself in a position to listen, listen to the shepherd, but you must obey, you must follow the Scripture warns us, now not be, James 1 tells us, now not be hearers only, but doers of the Word. Again, if you feel safe because you've heard the Word of God, know this, you are not. If you, if you feel safe because you could pass a test about who Jesus claims to be, you are not. You must follow. Take up my cross and follow me. We must turn from our sin and trust in the Savior and follow Him. And that is what sheep do. That is what the children of the Father do. Not only listen, but obey. The true sheep knows they must obey. Why do we not obey? Think about moments in your life. Think about moments in your children's lives. Why do they not obey? I think we all would say we don't obey when we think we know better than the person that's telling us to do something. Have you ever been, some of you can't, you're so holy you can't even think back that far, can you? When someone has said, hey, I think you should do this, they're in a position of authority over you and they say, hey, you should do this. And you go, yeah, I don't know that I'm really going to do that. Because we feel like, whether we're three or 63, we feel like, nah, I know better. But the image of the sheep, (laughs) and we discussed what a sheep is two weeks ago, right? There's nothing laudable about the character or quality or intellect of a sheep. A true sheep knows this. I am hopeless without the shepherd. A true sheep knows I better follow him. And the closer I follow him, the the safer I am. The closer I follow him, the more provision I will have. The closer I follow him, the better my life will be. 
If you recognize and understand yourself in that position, you will follow. When we understand that God knows better than we possibly could. But if you look at the text, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You would be tempted if you didn't read this too quickly, because this is a uh, this is a pretty familiar refrain for many of you. You've probably heard this before. We would be tempted if we slow down to see, to think, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me. So why is it? And this is a great biblical principle. If something is not as you think it would be, it's there on purpose. The Holy Spirit does this almost as a speed bump because we can get reading through the Scriptures really quickly. And if, if ever there's a, a normal pattern or a normal cadence and it's changed, if a different word is used or a different phrase is used or if something unexpected is done, that's to call our attention. And that's what Jesus is doing here. My sheep hear my voice and not they know me. I know them. What does that mean? And Jesus knows the sheep. And it's not just the type of knowledge that we think of. This is not historical facts. It's not that he knows your birthday. It's not that he knows how many hairs are on your head, though he does. This is not sports facts. Or where is Azerbaijan or Nauru watching the opening ceremonies? And we all act like we know where those places are, you know? And we don't. And, you know, your kids are going, where, so where is Azerbaijan? You're like, I don't know. Somewhere west of my couch is stand. You know, you're just, you're just trying to This is not the kind of knowledge that Jesus is talking about when he knows us. He certainly knows everything about your being, and he knows everything about your history. But that's not what it means when it says Jesus knows his sheep, because that's true of the wolves and the goats as well. Yeah, Jesus is perfect in his knowledge. When you think about record, he knows everything. But when the Scripture speaks about knowledge, it often uses the phrase like Adam knew Eve. There's an intimacy here. There is a love here. There is a, I love the phrase, setting affections upon. Sometimes we get wrapped up in doctrinal discourse and sometimes we miss things like affection. So we may run to a text like Ephesians 1 and we think, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. And then we jump over the next two words to get to predestined us for adoption. And we miss the fact, in love, he set his affections on us. Please understand that if you are a child of God, he has set his affections on you. He's not picked you in some sort of cold and calloused method. He set his affections on you. And that's why. He came and died for you, and that's why he will come and get you, and that's why he can keep going with the text and tell us even more, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Do you know, that's not a doctrinal discourse. That's not just, well, let's logically walk through this. Let's logically walk through, if God is sovereign and he's sovereign in the choice of us, then he also has to be sovereign in the end of us. That is true. But that's not how the scripture portrays it. The scripture doesn't say, well, God feels compelled. Ah, I picked that one. I better, you know, dance with the one that brung you, you know, brung you, you did that kind of thing. That's not it at all. It's not that he feels compelled to keep you because he has to be faithful. That's not it. That's certainly part of it. He keeps you because he loves you. Your security in Christ is rooted in his love for you. Now, we can get real wrapped up in that because we think about our love humanly and we think, I don't deserve it. And guess what? You don't. But the beautiful thing that we're going to find in this text is that love is unconditional. When he sets his affections on you, it's eternal. Look at the text. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The reality is, this is Christ's love for his people. He grabs us and holds us, and we are secure because we are his. Paul would write to the Colossians, and he would say this, For you were died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
Is there a safer place? Is there a more protected place than hidden with Christ in God? No one can take us out of His hand. That means we ourselves cannot. Some of us wonder, well, what if I do something to mess up so bad? Here is the truth of the matter, friends. Jesus set His affections on you. He set His affections on you not because of who you are or what you will do. He set His affections on you because He chose to love you. And if that doesn't make sense to you, you're getting closer and closer to biblical truth because it shouldn't make sense to us. It's why hymn writers write, and can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Well, I don't bring anything to the table. Absolutely, you don't. That's why our grace is not about our own works so that no one may boast. It's the most humbling and yet the most comforting truth in all of Scripture is that God is the author and finisher of our faith. Sometimes we think about this text and we think, oh yeah, the the perseverance of the saints, that saints are going to persevere to the end. And that is true. 1 John 2.19 tells us if they went out from us, then they are not of us, because if they were of us, they wouldn't have gone out from us. Or you can listen to Jesus' words, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And that is true. But what we're seeing here is God's perspective, God's persistence. Let me give you an image of this. If you had children, little children, and have you walked through a bad city or a bad part of town or walked next to a sketchy person. I have. And if you zoomed in really closely on me holding one of my children's hands, you may look and see from a distance that my child is holding my hand. But if you zoomed in close enough, you would see my knuckles become white. Because you know that sometimes in those, in those settings, that child could not discern, discern what kind of circumstances they're in. They can't discern the danger. And so they are tempted to run off because there's things that distract and things that compel. And so you would be able to tell, and the child can start to tell, and you can see the child start to wince because you have gripped. And there is a vice grip, and every dad and mom knows that there is a grip that you have that's greater than any grip that's anything else when you're holding your child's hand. That is what is expressed here. Do the faithful children of God hold on to God? Yes, we do. But guess what? That's not what keeps us. What keeps us safe is that the hand of God does not ever let us go. And nothing threatens it. It's laughable to think about the enemies that would come and take us out of his hand. And then I want you to notice what happens here. This is beautiful. Because we're tempted again to rush to verse 30. Verse 30 is like the campaign. This is the the campaign ad that Jesus would put out. And it divides. It doesn't unify. But we're, we're tempted to rush there. But I want you to notice how beautifully he leads up to this. We don't need verse 30. You don't need verse 30 when someone knocks on your door and tells you you should trust in Jesus who's not really God. You don't even have to go to verse 30. They're ready for verse 30, by the way. Like they, they think they can dodge it. Don't. Go ahead and go back a couple verses. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Whose hand are we in? Oh, we're in Jesus' hand. Whose hand are we in? Oh, we're in the Father's hand. How is that possible? It's only possible if Jesus and the Father are one. So for the hard-headed and the thick-skulled, guess what he does? Let me tell you what I mean. Verse 30. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Now, he uses the, the, even the, the grammar of this implies equality of essence, not with equality of person. What do we mean by that? Jesus is not a modalist, right, Patrick? Jesus is not a modalist. What does he say? What is a modalist? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That means that the Father takes off his hat and now he puts on the Son's hat and he operates, and then he takes off the son's hat, and he puts on the Holy Spirit's hat. That's what modalism means, and that's not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture teaches somehow that there is one God with three persons. One God with three persons, and Jesus is claiming that truth. He's not claiming to be a different God, and he's not claiming to be a God with a different hat. He is equating himself with God. Friends, and and this is beautiful. He says, I and the Father are one. 
Father and one, the Jewish God and one, those words ring out all kinds of truth. Why? Keep your finger there for me. I think this will be, you don't always have to turn to places, but I think this will just be helpful for you. Flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Maybe some of this sort of tactile movement will help you tie this together. Because I want you to really hear the weight of what Jesus is saying. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, it's called the great Shema, which is just a Hebrew word for hear, because it's, this is so important. This is one of the most well-known and well-embraced Jewish texts of all of the Bible. And this is where Jesus goes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? One. One. The text that points that Yahweh is one is the reference where Jesus says the Father and I are what? One. Turn back to John chapter 10. So Jesus is claiming to be God. (laughs) Are we confused about this? Are we uncertain about this? The Jewish people were not. Look at verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So if we are confused at this, at least they were not. The Jews did not believe Jesus, but they, you, you can bet your bottom dollar they knew what he was saying. You know without a doubt that the Jews knew what Jesus was claiming. He wasn't just claiming to be a prophet, because you only stoned a prophet if the prophet was wrong, and Jesus was never wrong. He wasn't simply claiming to be a teacher. You didn't stone a teacher, but you did stone one who claimed to be God. I and the Father are one. They ask for clarification, and Jesus gives them the response that He is divine. Now, this isn't the first time that they've been upset about this. For chapter 5 and chapter 8, we heard this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Him, not because He was breaking the Sabbath, because but because he was making himself equal with God. So they saw this clear reference to deity, and in response, Jesus jumps right back into his detractors. Again, this is not the political move. He doesn't go, whoa, 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 you're taking this too hard. Let's ease into this. He doesn't do that at all. He dials it back up. Jesus answers them, verse 32. I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? (laughs) Please do not miss the sarcasm that is here. Jesus is direct. What are you you stoning me for? Is it it the guy right here next to me that can see, that didn't see all his days? Are you stoning me for this one? Is it the lame man that keeps running around the city? He can't stop running because he was lame all his life and he didn't know anything else to do but just run? Is it that guy? Or is it the guy over here that remembers being on the hillside when I took a little boy's lunchbox and I fed the multitude? Which one exactly of those works are you stoning me for? Ooh, that wasn't political. That was harsh. That was direct. But Jesus is calling out the distinction between those who will follow him and those who won't. Which work are you going to stone me? The reality is they had no reason. They had done nothing wrong. This almost is a precursor to what Pilate says where he looks at the people and says, Why? What evil has he done? And they shout all the more loudly, crucify him. Because they're not interested in the truth. You can't argue with facts. You can't debate debate the lame man that's running around. You can't debate the blind man that is teaching people how to read. You can't debate those things. So the text goes, it's not works, Jesus, that you've done. It's because of blasphemy. Verse 33. The Jews answered him and said, it's not for a good work that you are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. If that was true, if he was a man making himself out to be God, he deserved to be stoned. But again, Jesus is just simply looking at his resume saying, what about my resume says I'm a man claiming to be God. But the reality is the Jews didn't want him to be 
who he claimed to be. They wanted him to be the Messiah in their own making. They wanted a political Messiah, a military leader. They wanted to not lose their power, but they wanted to be freed from Rome's. And here again is a danger for us. Do you make Jesus out to be the one that you want him to be? Do you fashion Jesus in your own eyes? Or do you accept Christ for who he claimed to be? If you use phrases like, my Jesus would never do that, or my Jesus would never do that, you're in dangerous territory. Because there isn't a my Jesus and a your Jesus, there's just Jesus. And just because some commercial says that Jesus gets you, doesn't mean that that's true. The question that should be is, do you get him? Like, what kind of audacity? He gets us. Yeah, well, that's not a good thing. Apart from him imposing in our life and intruding in our life, if Jesus just gets us, guess what he gets? Well, children of wrath, bent against him, enemies of the cross. But praise the Lord, he doesn't just get us, he comes and rescues us. Praise the Lord that it doesn't matter what you think about Jesus in the sense that it doesn't change who he is. What matters is, do you submit to who he is? You claim to be God. That's your blasphemy. Jesus takes this little aside for them. Verse 34, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If you called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say to the one who the Father consecrated and sent in the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. He's essentially saying this. God in the Old Testament at times would label people like Moses. You're going to go to Pharaoh and I am going to treat you so that, Moses, I mean, so that Pharaoh sees you as God. And he talks about people that embrace his word will be like gods because they will be communicating and bearing the image of God faithfully. And he's saying, if your word says that, are you really going to reject the one who has clearly, faithfully, and consistently manifested what was promised in the Messiah? And I love how his, his turn of phrase, because of your law, that's not because that law was any different than the law that Jesus was coming to fulfill. He's just pointing to their own hypocrisy. He's using their own words against him, against them. But the reality is Jesus claims to be one with the Father, and they reject him. And then he even says, look, I I get it if you're having difficulty with my words. But verse 37, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. Does not my work give credibility to what I'm claiming If I'm all talk, then don't believe. But if I've demonstrated power, at least believe the works and understand that God has sent me. This is all compelling, isn't it? Until it's not. Verse 39. So sad. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. And we could spend some time, some sort of fun time speculating on what that's like, or even just some wonderful time resting in the sovereign hand of God that nothing ever was going to move him or rush him or hurry him. And that's the same for you, right? The the timing of the cross is no different than the timings of your own trials in life. God is sovereign, and Jesus will not be crucified one second before he intends to be. And the same is true for every trial and every circumstance in your life. It's on the same timetable. It's managed by the same God with the same goodness, with the same ultimate end. So we could spend time enjoying that and just sort of fleshing that out. But I want to take a moment and just reflect on the rejection of these people presented with their Savior. They sought to arrest and kill him. So I just want to petition you today. I want to appeal to you today if you have not come to Christ, if you've not bent the knee, if you've not acknowledged that, yes, the Jesus of the Bible is the one who was promised and he's the one who's promised to come again. If, he is, if you do not take Jesus as being Lord of all, if you do not take him as being the one who can judge all of your wickedness and rebellion, if you do not take him as the one before whom you are guilty, I want to appeal you, to you today to do that because the one who will who can condemn you as guilty. The only one who can condemn you as guilty is the same one who willingly went to the cross for all who would ever believe. He willingly takes the guilt and the shame and the punishment for all who would ever embrace him. 
And it's not any works or effort. You don't have to clean up your act. You simply have to say, I'm done with my sin and I want my Savior. I reject the life of me on the throne and I want to recognize him on the throne. I trust in his provision, his life that was perfect, his death that was substitutionary, and his resurrection that was glorious. I put my hope there. I'll live my life there. That's all. If you do that, if you confess that, you will be saved. Not like these people that ran from the living word of God, that ran from their Savior, that resisted the King. Oh, dear friend, embrace Jesus today. Let today be the day where you acknowledge that He is Lord of all. Let today be the day where you can say, I am safe in the hands of the King. Let today be the day of the rest of eternity where no one will ever snatch you out of His hand. Let today be the day where the greatness of God becomes your glory and the goodness of God becomes your joy. Let today be the day for the rest of all eternity, the start of the rest of eternity for you. I'm thankful that John doesn't leave us just in the despair. Verse 40, so Jesus went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, so And there he remained, and many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. There is hope. God does give grace. It's not the majority. It's not the masses. Jesus will describe it as a narrow gate, and not many compared to the masses that choose to reject him, but I want to tell you there is hope. And I want to tell you that he promises that all who come to him will be held by him, that all who confess him, he will confess before the Father. There is hope for those who believe. Now make sure that we believe not as the Jewish people believed or as some pagan person might believe about the historical Jesus. We are to believe in Jesus as he claimed to be. He claimed to be the one who before the foundation of the world set his affections on his children. He claimed to be the one that in Genesis 3 would come and crush evil's head. He he claimed to be the one that would take the place of sinners. He claimed to be the king, the prophet, the faithful husband. He claimed to be the one that would be true and righteous and perfect and fulfill the law. He claimed to be all of these things. Do we embrace him? It is our prayer that you would today. Do you believe that he is good? Sure. Do you believe that he is compassionate? Absolutely. Do you believe that he is the Messiah? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is God? And if so, let us worship him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a humbling truth to recognize that apart from you revealing yourself to us, we would be left in our blindness. You were not compelled to leave the heavens and come and die for your children. You were not bound by anything outside of yourself to reveal to us who you are in your word. And yet you and your grace and mercy have not only given us your word, You've given us your very self. So, Lord, put to death any pride in this room and humble us. And yet, in your marvelous ways, cause us to stand in boldness. Because you have done what we needed to do. You have done what... We should have done. You have done and taken care of all that we owed so we can stand boldly before you. And so, Lord, when we come before your throne, we come with borrowed access, but access nonetheless. We come standing tall because Christ's work is worthy of it. We come without fear and doubt because Christ's work is worthy of it. And we come with security because the one that has grabbed us, will never let us go. So Lord, help us worship, not just in this remaining song and prayer, but help us worship in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.